when you look back at it so you've got this this wet market that's decimating local species and then you've got the infamous tetrachak market which is more of a uh, focusing on the pet trade as a whole so that's probably like three kilometers of just pet shops back then at its peak um three kilometers of just pet shops um and you'd walk into a pet shop and you could get some parsons chameleon um straight out of madagascar you'd go into the next one you could get some um big headed um some some a uh, platycerdon megacephalum by like the like tens of them so the the big headed turtles yeah and you'd walk in and there would never be any like um like oh this is society's conversation like it's really just pure business you feel and then the really interesting thing is that sometimes you'd you'd walk into these markets and and on a Monday morning, you'd see pickups come in and unload these massive trays. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. If my voice sounds a little bit off, I'm actually just regaining it after losing it on the weekend. So I'm not sure why I lost my voice, but it's a little bit off. So if it sounds kind of strange, my apologies there. Today, I'm speaking with Gabriel Matei, who is a vet student in London, but he's also born and raised in Thailand, which gives us an incredibly unique twist to this conversation. We discuss the wildlife markets and the wet markets in Thailand, how this, you know, growing up in the environment of being in Thailand really directed Gabriel towards being fascinated with colonians. And he's kept many different species species. So we spent a lot of this conversation discussing tortoise and turtle husbandry and some of the tips and tricks that he's picked up along the way. So if you're somebody that's wanting to get into turtle or tortoise keeping, this will be an absolute amazing episode for you. We discussed some of his experience being a vet student as well. Gabriel walks us through some of the more rare species he's worked with and bred, some of the ethics with when it comes to keeping tortoises, and also some of the species that will work great as a starter species if you're looking to get into keeping colonians in general. Enjoy the episode. All right. Well, Gabriel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I've watched a few of your podcasts uh, that you've done on this show. So yeah, looking forward to having a conversation today uh, about I th- mostly colonial um, husbandry, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think too, you, you bring a lot of interesting experience just from your upbringing, which we'll get into shortly. And just, you know, you have a I actually, someone was just asking me, we should have more people that have a more, more Asian experience uh, on the podcast, which is tough to get because, you know, there's obviously language barrier and whatnot. And, and then you would come to me and I said, oh, this is perfect. We, you know, growing up in Thailand, we, we can probably uh, learn a lot from you. So why don't we start just a little bit with the, uh, with your background as far as, you know, you don't, yeah. s- you, ha- you sound like you have an English accent or, <laughs> but you lived in Thailand or you live in Thailand. Yeah, so I'm a I'm a mix of everything really. So I'm French Canadian, uh, but I was born in Thailand. So, um, so I had the chance to spend 18 years in Thailand. So I basically did my whole high school uh, school time in Thailand, really. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was great to. I definitely got into reptiles because I was raised in Thailand and was basically, I was allowed to just see all these reptiles everywhere and um, and learn a lot from it. And it definitely motivated me to pursue my. Um, my uh career so yeah um so that's really my background is growing up in Thailand as a kid um I speak Thai because simply because I was embracing the whole culture of it and um yeah it's something that's bringing me a lot of of knowledge and just a lot of luck really just living in Thailand okay yes yeah that you have a very interesting accent that's why I, I can kind of hear a little bit of the obviously I'm Canadian as well so I'm used to the French Canadian yeah. accent but yeah. it's, it's being layered on top of like almost like an English <laughs> like a northern English accent as well so it's it, I'm sure that's from your schooling so so how old were you when you moved to Thailand so I was born there basically oh so you were born there okay parents, yes my parents moved there 30 years ago now so it's been a while and I was and I was born there, so it was really from the from the get go. Um, Thai wildlife, reptiles. As a kid, I was always a kid that w- we lived in a village, and in the village there was this big pond in the middle. And what I, I didn't know it back then, but when I look back at at the time, they used to have like temple turtles, so that's here semis and Andele, which are quite rare. And I just used to catch all these rare turtles and just you know, as a kid, you just enjoy all these things and just watching them. And then as I grew up, I started to actually wander past just uh, watching them and observing them but also like researching what species they are and then that got me into the other species that you find in other parts of the world and just the husbandry aspect started from there really Mm -hmm. Uh, are your parents into animals at all or is that just you know you obviously thailand is going to be a rich place for for animal life (laughs) Yeah, it was really as random as it comes. To, nothing okay. to do with it. It's just it was basically just me being able to be exposed to all these animals and reptiles around me as a kid. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, that's a, a definitely a different upbringing than you would have had in Quebec or wherever your folks were originally <laughs> yeah. from. You would see yeah. like one turtle a summer or something. So, so, so in that experience, you know, you're seeing these turtles. Did you start keeping them relatively soon, or, or tortoises, I say, and turtles? Um, so I, I, I was I started keeping my first tortoise when I was when I was seven years old. So it was kind of like uh, my parents brought me to um, an animal market and we just got a tortoise. I mean, it was an Indian star tortoise back then. And then it started at that with Indian stars. And then um, and then I bred those quite early on as a kid. And then because I would read a lot about husbandry and it allowed me to get them because it was really like a passion that started so early. Mm -hmm. So by the age of 11, I think I was breeding Indian stars. And then from there, I just kind of just enjoyed cracking the code of breeding colonians and then that just kept on going into a fascination of their husbandry yeah that's amazing and school wise at that time was there anything animal related or was this something that you were just totally doing on your own in your free time like on the summer vacation and days off and whatnot yeah it was definitely something i do on my free time i mean earlier on as a kid i was never that study driven i was it definitely came in longer um, towards high school where i realized that i wanted to be a vet where I actually sat down and just put the gas. But when I was younger, it was definitely more of a school was on the side and this whole new world that was so big. Because when you jump into like a or like a like a clone, the world of, of colonians or just reptiles in general, and you're passionate about it, this is so much unknown that it really just drives you to mm -hmm. to just push, push, push the the weirdest article you can find on Google Scholar about like some random tortoise. Like it just pushed me into finding all these husbandry aspects that weren't really well well written really i was really interested in that yeah yeah and I, i'm sure obviously the access that you had to different species was pretty wide yeah, yeah it was it was it was um i mean that's definitely what what thailand was known for i will probably hit on the cheddar shack market later on but there is def there was definitely this this aspect of i mean i didn't know much about it when i was young but once i i realized what was going on in that market is when I really just stopped buying things from there and just kind of going down the, the captive bread or legal imports really. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I never really touched Cites animals before they, well, I had some before they turned into Cites, but once, but you could find some Cites animals for sale. There were non Cites, of course, um, non Cites uh, um, um, certified, but you would definitely find, whole variety of not just turtles and tortoises but you'd get your amphibians mammals birds were massive um yeah it was the the selection I, I cannot even explain how crazy the selection is compared to like what you would have been exposed to in europe or or uh or, the, or america yeah 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 it's uh obviously you know we any anytime you read about wildlife trafficking or the illegal wildlife trade those asian countries thailand comes up a lot with these markets so i definitely want to ask about the markets uh, but before maybe you'd listed off a couple species but maybe you could just give us a few more that you that you were actually working with and keeping with uh through yeah. your high school years so the star tortoises is where it all started so i had indian star um those were totally legal and then i went into um, and then I went into pancake tortoises and the pancake tortoises for me is where like something clicked and I was like, wow, this is really like, like what I, what I want to do is, you know, like explore the world of colonial husbandry, just colonial reproduction, all that stuff. Cause I, no one was breeding pancake tortoises in Thailand. No, no one was. And so they were still um, imported legally. This was before they turned into societies one. Mm. And I got my hands on a few and, um, and all the, you know, these, these other people, they kept dying. So I was there going in Google Scholar looking for this weirdest article about their their biology in, in, in Kenya and, and what they were eating, what their climate was like. And I was trying to replicate all of that. And I think at the age of 15 or 14, I bred my first uh, captive bred pancake tortoise, which was, I think might be the first in Thailand, but I'm not sure. But no one else really, read, still to this day, no one else still readily breeds them. Um, I don't know why they were so tall. I think because they were re they really didn't acclimate well to the weather all of a sudden in Thailand. But um, yeah, that when I when I bred this pan the pancake tortoises, then the obsession just went fivefold towards <laughs> cracking other weird species. Yeah, I'm sure that experience of uncovering information that gave you success is that yeah. it's almost like an addictive experience right because you yeah. have these animals and then you get to see the animals thrive and and, and their well-being is increased yeah. but it also was directly due to your own research as a child that's yeah. pretty exciting yeah 
Do you remember what it was specifically like that you really figured out? I think what you really need is pure and simple in terms of breeding uh, tortoises in captivity, whether it is captive bred or whether it is wild caught, is you need established, uh, an established group. You just need an established pair. That's all you need. And what take and people don't realize how long it can take to establish a wild caught pair. How long they can need they need to get used to their circadian rhythm. They need to get used to the local weather. So a lot of people will get a new project, and you need sometimes four years isn't long mm. enough. Sometimes you need five years. Sometimes and all of a sudden it just cracks. But it's not necessarily something complicated you've done. Now that, now that I think back about it, um. Like, uh, for example, with the impressed tortoise, Minoria impressa, you've got these stories of people saying that you need to feed them 20 species of mushrooms because that's what's cracked it for me. But then you've got someone else feeding them a diet of a red foot and they're breeding them every year. Uh, but they might say that I hybridate mine at, on, like, at, at extremely low temperatures because in northern Thailand, it goes down to extremely low temperatures. I just think pure and simple, you need to have a well-established breeding group. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, so in some ways, you probably end up having this animal for a long period of time. Eventually, they start breeding, and you probably think it was the last thing that you changed, which, which was the answer, yeah. but really, it was just the time span that you've had them for. It's like, okay, maybe it's not the 30 mushrooms you gave her <laughs> to allow her to lay yeah. uh, healthy eggs. It was probably the fact that you've had her for six or seven years, yeah. and she's finally comfortable. Yeah, I think uh, it's important for us in the turtle and tortoise world to not say I way works our way works because uh, there can be a lot of times where you can say that you do it that way and all of a sudden you get a lot of um of not hate but you get a lot of people looking down on that method because it doesn't work for them but everyone's husbandry situations is different especially if you're keeping them outdoors mm. it's different for everyone really success with tortoises is is it just depends on on if you're doing it right and it works and you stick to it you know and and if you're not breeding yet Try a few things, but don't drastically change something because someone is having success with it. As long as your pair is alive and doing well and you see some some breeding, tweak a few incubation temperatures, but it but things will work out, I feel, over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great tip. Um, maybe we can list just a few more species that you've worked with, and then I have a couple questions about your career path, and then we're gonna get into the markets. Yeah. So um so it went from pancake tortoises and then I stayed on the route of the weird and exotic because I've always loved that. And then the Knixis crave started. Mm. So I bred Knixis erosa, Knixis uh, nugei, I always get that name wrong now. Uh, and then can, my biggest one was Knixis zombensis. So I was lucky enough to get two babies from Knixis zombensis. And then uh, not the most proud of this, but um, one of my zombensis males escaped and then uh, copulated with my female Belliana and I created the world's first hybrid of <laughs> Belliana and Zombensis. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's not something I wanted to do, but it, it happened. It happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah but those were my feeds in Knixis. So a few species there, but th- those were Zombensis was like a nightmare. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you've had Jeremy Thoms- Thompson mm-hmm. on, on the podcast and uh, he can probably tell you just how complicated breeding Zombensis is. It's like, but then again, for me, it was three years of establishing a pair and nothing special. Keeping outdoors, high protein food, um, separating males and females, large enclosures, incubation. I did one year. One year, I I decided to incubate uh, Bangkok temperature, winter drop, and then fertility happened after fertility chalking happened once um the winter drop in temperature happened whether it whether it made an impact or not i would need to have 50 more eggs and see but yeah yeah it, but like it, again time three years yeah yeah okay that makes sense yeah so i, I want to we'll get into husbandry too because i kind of want to hear about your setups and you know how you're keeping them and whatnot yeah. but uh, t- tell us a little bit so i mean i know a lot of this was happening when you're in high school and maybe a little bit after high school at some point you decided i want to be a vet yeah. And maybe you could talk about that process because being in Thailand, I, yeah. I know, you know, you go to, to vet school in, in, in Europe. So maybe tell yeah. us about that process. So, yeah. So I, I just, I, I told myself that um, I quite enjoyed biology a lot. And, um, I, and there was a point in my life where I decided to put the effort into school and, um, and just was like, oh, I'm going to pursue being a vet because I feel like it, it can be quite satisfying 
in especially in the reptile world where there's a lot of knowledge to be found and to be discovered and especially just in your basics such as husbandry methods and all that so I told myself that's a career path I want to pursue so I studied and then um, I was lucky enough to go to an, 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 an international school in Thailand so they did a they did a high school degree that was known throughout the world which I could apply to universities too mm. and for me the United Kingdom was was kind of my my chosen area to go to because it's a five-year course it's not as long as doing the undergrad than the postgrad in the U.S. so I decided to go down that route and um, yeah no regrets and I've been I've been enjoying it. So you started vet school right out of high school then the five-year program in the U.K. is uh, like you yeah, start so in it right and- Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's right out of high school. So at the age of eighteen, I left home and went straight. So now I'm in my fourth year. So almost finished soon, hopefully. So one more year to go after this yeah. this year. Yeah. Okay. So this, yeah. And so, what was the? Was there some challenges applying? Like, is that a difficult program to get into? Yes, it is. It is difficult, but it's very rewarding. And and I don't think you should ever let yourself be told that getting into veterinary is too hard for you. It is. There is no such thing. I mean. If you looked at the grades I had when I started high school or like towards the later and not the, but the middle age of high school, I wasn't getting the best grades. But it's um, if you use that motivation and and if you use the fact that veterinary is a hard thing to get into and you kind of just sit down and use that passion and also the fact that it's difficult, all these things can just give you that motivation to just I mean, it, I'm not going to lie. I spent hours and hours studying and. I don't regret it now. I mean, it was great and satisfying to get into a career that that's my passion, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I had a similar experience in university when I went. My first few years were horrible, like just terrible. And I was taking easy courses and basically failing them. And then I, there was just a mindset shift where you realize, oh, oh I'm just yeah. going to try to get A's on everything. And then, yeah, yeah, you study harder, but it's almost like a game. And suddenly yes. you actually can get A's if you work. Yeah. It's very weird. Yeah, yeah it is. But yeah, but I mean, getting in, you need the grades and you do interviews and then you need to have some prior work experience. I mean, yeah, I mean, if anyone watching this podcast is a young herb, her, like a young herb loving person that wants to uh, pursue veterinary medicine as a career and it's a bit challenged about the university thing, I'm sure to answer some questions about applying to Europe or anything like that. But yeah, speak to your university counselor, speak to speak to other vets, speak to everyone and then just see if it's something that you want to pursue because it's a big commitment. Uh, yeah, yeah. After all. And you're in London, right? That's where the school is? Yeah, yeah, London, yeah. Okay. And so has the four years gone fairly well? Has it been a, a, quite a challenge? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, no, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed all of it. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, it all goes by really fast. And uh, and it's it being away from Thailand has made me realize how fortunate I was to, to be raised here and how it's given me a very interesting um, experience in terms of reptiles and the, the species I've been able to work with and and see in captive collections. Yeah, yeah. And so afterwards, when you finish, what what will you, will you go back to Thailand and and work there, or you have no clue yet? That that is a big unknown for me, really. <laughs> so many options, but um, perhaps maybe pursuing something down the line of of clinics that see a, a bit of reptile cases and and slowly getting my feet into the whole reptile world of medicine would be quite um, rewarding. Yeah, yeah. And I guess speaking Thai is probably a huge benefit. You can potentially work, work in Thailand. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If if, if there is work that has that, if there's a rep, big reptile zoo or a collection that needs a, a veterinarian or something like that, then I'd be more than happy to travel the world to to help out in that aspect, wherever, wherever that is. What is the reptile keeping community like in Thailand? You were saying, you know, you, you probably were some of the, you know, breeding some of the first captive bred yeah. tortoise species in captivity. Is it a pretty big community or is it just uh, not not huge? It is. It is quite big, but I would say that I was able to breed pancake tortoises for the first time or maybe second or third because they're not as many people were interested uh, in pancake tortoises as they must have been in Europe and America. Barely anything if you compare because Thai people like big tortoises. They like big they like your flashy tortoises so they they like your radiated tortoises they like your plowshare tortoises there's a lot more plowshares in thailand than people will admit there is a lot of plowshare <laughs> tortoises in thailand there is an unholy amount of them um and then uh you start you're starting to see them on social media now and it's making everyone realize like whoa there's some pages on instagram where there's 10 plowshare tortoises just walking in someone's yard yeah um, aldabra crazy Aldabra tortoises everywhere. Now, um, I think in Thai society, having an Aldabra tortoise is um, 
is quite like a good thing to have. And also, um, I think the turtles and tortoises are kind of a symbol of luck in Thailand as well. So you have a lot of a lot of Aldabra tortoises at the moment. So that's a big, big crave. They've been importing them from somewhere and there's just like a lot of them at the moment though mm. legally which is good but they go for a lot of money and people seem to be loving the other tortoises at the moment at least it's a climate that they can be kept outside and you're not seeing somebody put it into like a little pen in their basement or something yeah yeah i'll give you that if they've got a big garden they those other tortoises are quite well kept because um uh, Thai people love to keep their tortoises outdoors so at least that's good. But um, that's why they don't keep pancake horses and things like that as much because they it's just kind of want to bring out door and yeah. let it be, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah, yeah. Whereas something like a pancake, you need to have like, you need to have a, a, a little roof over it and maybe a heat lamp or something like that. And that just gets a bit too complicated. But when you can get like a big Aldabra tortoise, that's going to be impressive and walk walk the, the garden and just not be so fragile, then I see the appeal could be a bit stronger in that aspect. Yeah, that makes sense. And then what about lizard and, and snake keeping? Is that is there a community there for that as well? Yeah, the iguana, the iguana uh, uh, keeping community here is massive. So you'll have every morph. I think um, Crutchfield's morph of iguanas came into Thailand really, really quickly because mm. um, I remember seeing them quite quickly. And and every morph you have in the US, you probably will find in Thailand. And there must be some import export thing going on there because you th- it, there's a lot of of Thai people that do keep iguanas and the snakes, the whole ball python story, that's the same in Thailand. I mean, um, you it's sad that not a lot of people in Thailand have gone down the niche uh exotic, kind of like dark exotic uh species and has had a lot of success with them, like with Kinixis, with Homopus, with um with um Chersina angulata. So all these really rare tortoises that used to come in a lot. Like Pixis and Pixis arachnoides, Pixis, Pixis panicauda, they used to come in by the hundreds, but no, I, but I never got hands on them. But a lot of people did, but they didn't put in the effort that they, those tortoises deserved because they weren't two hundred dollars; they were fifty dollars yeah. back then. But there's a there's a big stigma I feel in this country where if something isn't too expensive, it's quite replaceable. Right. Yeah, so yeah. The, in, in some ways, the reptile becomes more like a status symbol, kind of like you were saying with the Eldabra. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's yeah. a, a, a symbol of being you know well off yeah. if you have a big tortoise yeah. in your backyard. Yeah, I feel there must be something like that because um, there is really very little interest in these rare and exotic tortoises, which is such a shame because if we just change the mindset 10, 10, 15 years back when the trade was at its fullest, the trade would have happened anyways, but at least we would have, benefited from all the illegal imports and kept them alive and got in a good captive breeding selection going on because it kind of makes it seem that all those illegal all those illegal things were kind of a waste of effort yeah. really we haven't held on to those species because they came in decimated in the wild and we haven't held on to the really rare ones like the homopus like all these really unique south african namibian species that were here back then that we haven't seen and we won't see again but we yeah. had a chance but it never happened yeah, it's like if you're going to import illegally, you, you you should at least try to make sure that they don't die, you know, that they yeah. can have generations yeah. uh, beyond yeah. just themselves. Yeah, I mean, first of all, <laughs> if we didn't import illegally, we wouldn't have these problems. And then if we import illegally, at least make an effort to, yeah, to at least know the worth of that animal. Yeah, exactly. So tell me a little bit about the markets, because that's, a, we kind of alluded to it earlier, that's a very unique thing to asia it's but you know in in china thailand yeah. vietnam they have you know these these markets are pretty prominent and that's where a lot of i guess you could just say bizarre wildlife trade can happen whether it's legal or yeah. illegal so why don't you for people that have no idea just give us a, a background of what yeah. this look like so i think in in asia you had this twofold problem where first of all you had a wet market so the wet market was the one that would decimate local species of turtles and tortoises because most likely than not, your average person isn't interested in keeping local species. Mm-hmm. So the wet market is where the diet that the, the the wet market supplies food and diet of the the country. So for in a lot of these Asian countries, um, uh, Cura amboinensis, Hyosemis anandelle, yellow temple turtles, and uh, Asian box turtles were were kind of eaten a lot. So I remember walking in as a kid in these markets that were not 
pet markets, right? So they're simply wet markets selling um, seafood and all that. So you see buckets of turtles, like buckets, like you're talking no crawl space with a net on top full of temple turtles. You'd go to the other one full of box turtles and all that. And uh, whether that was regulated or not, I'm not sure. I mean, it was 10 years ago. I can't really say anything about that. But um, when you look back at it, so you've got this this wet market that's decimating local species. And then you've got the infamous Tetrachak market, which is more of a uh, focusing on the pet trade as a whole. So that's probably like three kilometers of just pet shops back then at its peak. Um, three kilometers of just pet shops. Um, and you'd walk into a pet shop and you could get some Parsons chameleon um, straight out of Madagascar. You'd go into the next one, you could get some um, big headed, um, some, some uh, platycerium megacephalum by like the like tens of them so the the big headed turtles yeah so you could get a lot of those and then maybe you'd be lucky and you'd find some cura species from vietnam and the guy would tell you that he's just got them in this morning and that they were really rare and um and you'd walk in and there would never be any like um like oh this is society's conversation like it's really just pure business you feel and then the really interesting thing is that sometimes you'd you'd walk into these markets and and on a Monday morning, you'd see pickups come in and unload these massive trays of just turtles. And then they'd go to all these retailers. And there were a few times when I was in a retail shop and then I, you'd listen to to these Malaysians speaking to these Thais in English talking about exporting these turtles into Malaysia. So, the, so what I think happened is that Chilichak was kind of a hub. So all everything came in through that. Then you'd get retailers that would come in from other countries and then, and then people in Thailand would export them to neighboring Asian countries. So, and that was international species. So we're talking um, like your plowshare dealer would be there, like like really bad stuff, man. That's really probably like like done some serious damage to the the wildlife of um, the the wildlife in general and birds as well. I think birds probably took the biggest hit. You could easily see birds of paradise back then for sale wow. openly. Um, hornbills, toucans from South America. Um, I mean, at those really rare species of macaw, you can still find them in Thailand, like this, the hyacinth macaw. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't quote me on the species, but the really rare blue ones are still bred in Thailand because they were imported illegally back then. That's crazy. That I'm, you know, bizarre, especially as a child, because you don't fully grasp the, yeah. the like the magnitude of how bad that actually is. And, and especially if you're an animal lover, you're like, oh, this there's so many cool animals in here. You're gonna yeah, walk you're through there. What's cool? Yeah. Yeah, so it was when I was around 14, 15 that I started reading all these traffic, uh, the traffic organization um, articles that I'd released about Chaduchak. And I was looking at the species that they saw and I was like, man, there's some species that I've seen that because I was going year round mm -hmm. and there probably weren't. And I was seeing some stuff that I was seeing some stuff on that list that I haven't seen. But at the same time, I was like, oh, there's some stuff on my, li on, my, on my list that's like that should be included in there just because how rare and and you'd never expect like uh, the gray's monitor for around this gray eye. I've oh, yeah. seen that there already. Wow. Yeah. So, so what about government officials? Is, is there no people walking through there making sure this is not, uh, and cause you know, a lot of this would be wild, wild caught animals coming in and then probably having some fake paperwork or things and then to sh export them back out of the country in, into like Malaysia, for example, legally, yeah. but not actually legal. So was mm -hmm. there no like officials walking through and, or they do not care about it? I mean, I'd only be able to speculate, really. I feel like traffic would have the best information about that. But I mean, it, it, there's no no doubt that there was that it was illegal. If you if I if you see all these animals for sale, um, but um, I'll tell you what though, there was it was getting it was illegal for a while, and then all of a sudden, um, there was this thing that must have that these pressures. I think traffic were building up all these pressures, and all of a sudden everything moved to Facebook mm. and the shops disappeared in, and then instead came in these shops with aircon that were selling high-end bearded dragons, high-end ball pythons, uh, sulcatas, leopard tortoises, everything that was completely illegal went to Facebook and it made it, I think, even easier <laughs> because oh. people would have one dealer on Facebook and he'd message everyone, I've got this coming in from this person, it's this price, reaching tens of people at once they don't even need to leave their house they just get it shipped to them yeah yeah and no one knows what went on in everyone's dm on facebook because it wasn't on profile it was all on dm i can imagine that a lot of trade went on uh, like 
even more than in the market itself. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, I still sometimes get people messaging me from from Africa or wherever as an import a reptile exporter and they'll send you a yeah. Excel file with a with a price yeah. list and you're like, "Oh my god, this is not yeah. good." Yeah. But um th- just to say that th- I think 4 years ago my friend was messaged by a Thai someone in Thailand offering plowshare tortoises that were captive bred actually. Um for like a lot of money, but I uh, I'd say at least they're captive bred, but the those the origins are definitely not legal. But at least we're getting there where they can be sold captive bred behind the doors. But there yes. is some some captive breeding effort, of, a lot more captive breeding effort of plowshares in Thailand than one would expect. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that it's obviously a very different uh, culture as far as the wet markets go. Like you say, you know the it's diet related as people are buying that food yeah. to eat, but then you also have the whole pet exotic pet trade, which is, yeah. which is kind of a, a bizarre, but also people in North America and Europe also are, are pulling from those environments as well into yes. our own private trade. Yeah. It, it, you must say that Europe, Europe did buy from that market. That there, there, sure. there must have been some connection because things would come from Madagascar and stuff in, in Bangkok because Bangkok back then was Suona boom was one of the biggest airports in Southeast Asia. And who knows what security was like. We'd just be speculating there. But they needed to stop somewhere and then go back somewhere else. And and whether Europe's pool was into Thailand, you need to you need to find some old herb person that will be able to expo- uh, like exploit the, the trade secrets about how the hell they made it into Europe and America. But you know they did. That's the thing. Yes, you know they did because plowshares have made it in those countries many times. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of stuffing weird things into suitcases and wrapping tin foil yeah, you and must, all that. Yeah. It must have been a lot easier than people made a kid seem. Yeah. I feel like a few people got caught, but I feel like it is a lot it must be a lot easier than people make it seem to have seen those numbers in Europe and America. Well, even if you go through an airport now, I mean those scanners are pretty detailed, like when you throw your bag through, like they they really yeah. can go right through and you know highlight different I- items. And I'm sure that's relatively new technology. If you go back twenty years or yeah. thirty years, that sort uh-huh. of scanning technology was not necessarily a, a common thing and maybe not common in, in Asia even, right? Or if, if they were landing in small airports in Europe, yeah, maybe that wasn't uh, an issue. Yeah, who knows? I mean, there was one day I was walking. This was when I was sixteen or seventeen. So not too long ago, so you're saying six years ago or something like that, I was walking by Tedrashack Market. So kind of during its time where it was, where I thought most things were quite legal at, in terms of legal, uh, but most things were okay. And I walked down the main alley and then I see someone carrying like a bag and, and it's slightly lit and it's kind of like a, a case bag. So kind of like one of them, uh, like a like something you'd carry your cat in or a rabbit in. So yeah. and the lid and the, the top was slightly opened and I looked in and I see a plowshare tortoise, like a baby one. And uh, and I was and then I was like, oh man. And then I was like, is this captive bread? Is this wild caught? But that was a that's the first time I've ever seen one in person. And I think it hits different when you see one in person and you go like what there's like a hundred or fifty in left in the wild and you've just seen one there. Like yeah. So at that point, you get hit with the fact that this is just not not correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what about mammals? Would you see lots of different species of mammals in those markets? Oh, yeah. The mammals is even, like, ethically speaking, it's even worse because of how they're kept. Um, monkeys, South American monkeys, capuchins, spider monkeys, cages they're the size of their body, you know, like wow. spinning around. Re- round and round and round because of the lack of enrichment it was completely unethical um that quickly went away once i think things changed for the better that quickly went away but um but yeah like um you when i look back now like it and then they had this whole thing about keeping squirrels in captivity and if you went these shops basically were kind of outdoor shops. They were stalls. They weren't your classic pet shop with aircon and all the accessories. You'd be lucky if a pet store was selling you accessories. Right. Uh, so some of these were squirrel focused. So they'd have cages that were probably this size with a sc- adult squirrel in it. And then they'd have one squirrel with, with, with a piece of string around its neck. That's kind of like the show squirrel. So that's attached to all these cages and the squirrels just goes around. And they were selling these squirrels that were like kept in, in these small cages like this uh, in the sun. And you'd have a lot of people that bought these squirrels. And I was always wondering like, why? Yeah. 
you see them outdoors you see them because in bangkok they're everywhere you see them outdoors running around why do you need to have one with string around its neck in your house yeah it's weird hey i mean when you really look into that kind of the side of the wildlife trade you realize there's a lot of people that just keep and buy animals just for the sake of doing it and they don't actually yeah. there's like yeah. a disconnect it's not the same as us who keep the animals who are very focused on improving their welfare making sure that we're understanding their environments giving them the best possible life instead there's people that just want to keep things and they'll keep whatever's available like if it's going to be a yeah. squirrel even though you can see one in your backyard running up a tree you want one in your yeah. own home but yeah but it at least thailand is getting good now uh CITES in thailand is getting quite good people are starting to register their animals um they've i, th I don't know i've heard that they've made it that if you got plowshare tortoises radiated tortoises or, or some CITES animals before a certain date and you can show it you can get them legalized or something like that. Not fully legalized, but you can breed them if uh, right. some. So I think you're gonna we're gonna see a lot of, of really rare species all of a sudden getting bred in Thailand and coming out. Uh, like Shitra. Shitra is mm -hmm. starting to be quite big in Thailand. Um I saw I saw a collection of Shitra Shitra the other week. So it's probably like one of the world's big rarity in in the turtle world. So you're speaking about some of the largest freshwater turtles uh, some brackish so yeah i mean shitras get massive they're, they're kind of like the holy grail of soft shell turtles really yeah they look totally bizarre too yeah they're a very unique animal i mean so when i i visited this guy's collection in thailand and i think he, i think he got them ages ago and um and are he, they endangered and, in the wild oh they're critically endangered okay oh, critically. okay yeah so you're you're talking shitra shitra you you barely hear reports of them being found so they're really okay. really rare um they're 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 extremely rare actually um so there's very few zoos in the world that keep chitra i think you've got one zoo in france that has chitra indica maybe another one um it, that has other chitras but if you speak to a, a turtle fan they'll tell you that chitra is one of the holy grails in the soft the genus itself and um yeah i mean they get they get massive um and I was just seeing them um these little babies that were captive bred and it kind of makes you feel good that you know like Sheetras pump out a lot of babies simply because of how big they are. So going down that way, if we can just kind of get rid of this demand for this wild animal, even though we've taken in so many, hopefully we can just get enough babies to just get rid of this demand. Hey there, I'd like to take a quick break from the episode to thank this week's sponsors. We have Exotics Keeper Magazine, which is a herpetoculture-based magazine out of the UK. If you live in the UK, you can have the physical magazine delivered to your house on a monthly basis for only a couple of pounds a month. If you happen to live somewhere else in the world, you can sign up for the digital copy of the magazine, which is completely free at this time, which is an incredible opportunity to really sink your teeth into some amazing articles. It is a very well-rounded magazine, including articles on advancing reptile care or just exotic animal care in general conservation efforts, zoo news, and probably my favorite articles are the ones that are written by people who keep particular species. So you have features on particular species, including their care guide, how to breed them, you know, the nuances of caring for each species. So if you are looking for more information, head to exoticskeeper.com. Again, the digital copy is free, so there's absolutely no reason not to sign up for it. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring the show. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you use that link and purchase something, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you, which of course helps support your own animal with a high quality enclosure and helps support the podcast and keep the lights on in this room. Let's jump back to the episode. Yeah, and hopefully the wild population can start to rebound a little bit and just be left yeah. alone. Yeah, the really the really cool thing about Chitra though is that that um they've really done well in this whole uh, the, the whole it was kind of a challenge when you look at the paper that's because there's a few species of them and they look very similar to each other but they're, this, they're a bit like um like they've, they're from different rivers and each river has a different species so in Thailand you've got the Mekong that has the Chitra Chitra and then you've got another one that has a um, Chitra Van, Van Dykes I think don't quote me on that but um and then there's a very very little difference in them but you're telling yourself one river could easily be poached of all of those and then mm. you've just lost a whole population that's evolved over hundreds of years because that river is separated into another course and you're kind of losing that whole evolutionary uh, beauty of creating a new species and i mean that's really sad because of the the yeah i mean she trees are definitely in in in, in a plight in asia yeah yeah so hopefully that can start to rebound and like you said they're such a bizarre looking creature like i can't tell if they look like on, in an evolutionary time frame if they're new or very old like when you look at them you almost look like that 
eventually you could see how a turtle shell would evolve from something like that. But you could also imagine a turtle shell evolving into that soft shell. I don't know. If, do you know anything about the evolutionary timeline of, of them? Like, I mean, that's totally a random question. It's just when I no, look at them, I, they, they look like yeah. I can't tell if they're at the end or at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, uh, they're for me, they're complete like like mystery as well. And they're really cool because when you, when, you, when, you, when you grab them out um, and then you put them back in, their first instinct is to really dive and then just just cover themselves with sand 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 yeah. and if you look, if you look at the adults there's a few videos from maybe san diego zoo or some zoo where even the biggest adult as soon as it's in the water it goes down and it digs 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 and then and, and they're, they're they're massive these adults and the fact that they can submerge themselves and just be an ambush predator is quite amazing how big would the adults get um oh well, i'm I, I i i i couldn't tell you some numbers but definitely the size of a large table like there's okay there's a, there's uh the university in thailand has has um a sheet for a sheet for a specimen that's under a uh, formalin or something like that and and it must have been 160 150 centimeters long okay so yeah huge yeah and you're, you're talking not even its neck fully expanded right just like the shell maybe, basically maybe 140 centimeters but this thing was i saw it and i was like wow and if you see the bones as well from them because they have this whole natural history museum in thailand at a university where you can see the layout of them and it 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 really is just impressive and how we don't have many of them anymore is just sad yeah yeah well that's amazing and like i said this kind of goes back to the, just the experience of being in thailand and getting to grow up there and and be there in your off time as well you get to experience so much more yeah. than we would you know in north america or europe are there any other experiences in thailand that that were kind of foundational for you or, or think stories or things that have happened to you at like reptile related growing up there i mean it, for me it's i've always really enjoyed coming back and visiting you know private people's collections which are really like close to the public and and i mean you i've seen some rare stuff that people keep like the whole sheet truth thing is really rare badagers Mm. Uh, from a finis, from so many different species, people are big on the Badagers, uh, the Caligars, uh, the Orlithias. These ones get really big as well. So all your big river terrapins as well are quite big in Thailand, and you have a lot of people breeding them as well. So that's starting to be good. Um, but believe it or not, I've seen most cura species in Europe. I haven't seen many of them in Thailand. Mm. People don't find interest in them here. People won't justify paying that money when you can have an Aldabra tortoise roaming your yard. Yeah, yeah, kind of getting back to that status symbol, and if things are, and there's that, and there's always that allure of something that's uh, exotic, right? Rather than yeah. being something that's native and, the, and whatever, yeah. it makes people like it more. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, the it would it, it's a shame that no one really started the Cura Foundation. There could have been someone in Thailand, but no one's publicly showing their success with Cura species. Because I'm sure the majority of the really rare ones that didn't look like much, you know, like your Orocapitata, your Macordia, they, they didn't really look like something you'd, you'd go into the shop and straight pick out. You know, you need to know that this thing is rare, mm -hmm. rare, super rare, and, and you're better off, you know, hel helping out and creating a breeding project with them. But um, to your average eye, they just wouldn't look like much compared to a, a, a red foot tortoise that's more colorful. All right. Do you interact with other reptile keepers there on a regular basis? Like, do you communicate with people or have like a herb society at all? Um, it, it is it is quite difficult because um, the Thai method of keeping tortoises is quite different to what I, I do. So, for example, if we're talking about um, keeping pancake tortoises or African species, I quite enjoy keeping them outdoors. But with like a roof or something for the pancakes, whereas the sulcatas can be outdoors all the time for me. Yeah. I've had success like that. Uh, whereas Thai people might be a bit too scared to going outdoors. So they might keep their pancakes in the house with a heat lamp that's way too hot on top of the ambient temperature that's dehydrating them. And I've seen a lot of them, I think, die from that. I think, I think that there's too much emphasis on the tortoise, on the old saying that a tortoise comes from a hot environment let's 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 heat it up and burn it you know yeah 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 like the oven style of keeping a tortoise whereas i've realized that bangkok's average temperature is more than okay to never even have to put a heat lamp on them yeah like how how, how what's a warm summer day and then uh like a cool winter day the coldest it gets is 19 degrees oh i never God. have to so that for celsius so i've never to worry about anything like never once have i turned on a heat lamp for my collection 
That's crazy. And then in the in the winter, or sorry, the summer is probably like into the forties with the humidity. Yeah, forties, you know. And then that's so that's why all of my knicks had water, water, water wallows or whatever it is. So I'd make sure that those were always put. Um, I was big on on that. Yeah, just so they can cool off. Yeah, and I had a lot of misting systems and all that stuff uh, during the summer because that's when stuff can 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 go quite bad. It's it's more of a question of heat, heat, heat being too high in Thailand than it being too cold. Yeah, yeah. So, so why don't you just lay out? I don't know if are you keeping anything right now? Obviously, with school and whatnot. Um, no, I'm not keeping. It. I've got a few Varanis in the UK, but I'm really not experienced enough to be talking about those. But um, what I had, what I, what I, what I had a garden, and you can kind of, if you look at my Instagram, I've got a lot of stories of the enclosures and all that. So, I, if if that interests you, I'm sure you'll have like the link or something in the bio. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I've got an Instagram, and you can kind of see I've got all my enclosures set by species. So. The pancakes were kind of under a roof, uh, but they were kind of kept outdoors. The um, Knixis all had really large enclosures, and I'd get um, I'd get elephant grass seeds from Africa, and I'd plant them in a Knixis enclosure. And they had like the savanna af- elephant grass that was taller than me, that was spanning to like 190, 200 uh, centimeters, and and then and and it would take me like ages to find them in there. And um, I really enjoyed that because when it rained. Um, you would see the Knixis on benches kind of marching. The males would march, march, and follow the females. And then the Knixis erosa would do the same. The males would come out. And all of a sudden, all your males would be out when it was ra- ra- raining. And I'd often be there in the rain with the with the little rain jacket just watching it all happen. Because it was genuinely like, you don't realize how much of a stimulus rain is when it comes to tortoise, tortoises and turtles. Once you, That's another really good tip for breeding is if your males are being a bit lazy, separate them keep them quite dry, but not too dry, obviously, leave a water bowl, but put them with that female, put a fog on, put a missing system on, make sure your enclosure is well irrigated and literally pump them with water and that male is going to be stimulated. There's definitely something there to do with with this whole, uh, the rain bringing in new grass, bringing in new food, bringing in um, insects that come out, with the insects that come out, the females come out, the males come out, it, it, it's a whole frenzy. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that, obviously, a good rainfall in a desert is going to spark life, yeah. and it, it makes yeah. sense that that would be a breeding cue. Yeah. So yeah. So every time it rained, the, fem- the uh, they all come out, they drink a bit, and then the males would would go on and and chase the females. And it was the same in in the turtles because I only kept terrestrial turtles, so I had Melanochelis tricurinata. These are like a a huge rarity. We'll get onto how I I got those later on, but I don't I don't know if I don't even know if anyone keeps them in the U.S. Um, I don't think there so. Was one, there was one ad about them um, in Europe. I think two breeders or three, uh, but they're generally like a, a massive rarity. A few zoos in Europe, two zoos in Europe have them. Um, Were they really native to? Um, uh, they're native to India and Nepal. Okay. So they're 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 quite specialist species in the in the terms that they're quite high altitude species, and and yeah, so even those would come out when it rained, and the Heosemis spinosas. The spiny turtles would come out when it rained. It, it was, it was. I really loved it. <laughs> so, how did you divide the yard? Did you just have like wood panels or yeah. something to create little yeah, tr- troughs? Wood panels, yeah, yeah, wood panels separated by species. And and uh, yeah, my parents would always come in one month to the other and say, "Oh God, he's added another wood panel. There's something <laughs> good. There's something new going on in there." So yeah, so um, I kind of use I kind of use the money I'd make from breeding pancake tortoises and star tortoises to kind of. Because I was always into the cheap stuff, you know, the stuff that no one else cares about. So for me, I was always very satisfied um, just breeding these tortoises that no one else wanted to breed or no one mm. else was interested in breeding. Yeah, yeah. And then, so when you went to vet school, is that when you moved the collection on? or? Yeah, I've moved it all on into good hands, into people that 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 I think care about these more niche cryptic species. Mm. And eventually, I'm sure one day, once you're kind of settled back down somewhere, will you start it back up again? Yeah, I don't know where that'll be, but it'll it'll be tough to have. I probably will never have some species I had there, but at least I'll definitely go and sit down and put some effort into some other cryptic species. I really enjoy the African species, Homopus, Samobates, um, all of those are really cool. Yeah. And so why don't we discuss just in general, tortoise and turtle husbandry. You know, you've mentioned a few things, but you know, one of yeah. the, I think the, most obvious things about your husbandry is you were keeping outside and yeah. keeping us out obviously gives you access to the the elements, the sun, the rain and space and ventilation and whatnot. And that is that 
in your mind extremely crucial when it comes to keeping tortoises and 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 turtles? I think I think keeping outdoors can be detr detrimental, like bad for newly imported species. Mm -hmm. I think when when I first had a species that came in, like Kinexis back in the days, I would keep them, I would bring them in, leave them in one inch of water for 24 hours, right? So I'd separate them, they'd each get a bath, I'd close the lid, make it dark, put some holes in it, 24 hours in water. Um, I think that is imperative when you're when when you've got wild caught that's coming in rehydration before even bothering it leave it in a dark thing for 24 hours good amount of water but not too much but that's what that's how I had my success with with them and then I kept them indoors so I kept them in tubs I made sure that they were bare bottom and that every time they would uh, have feces or 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 urinate that would be cleaned, rinsed, disinfected, right? So you're break you're, the idea is that you're breaking down the life cycle of all these parasites that are flourishing. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, um, so by doing that, you're decreasing the burden of parasites so that, and, and leaving them with little stress. And then I went to the vets, got them wormed, and made sure they were indoors for a few months, for a few weeks later, till the whole parasite cycle of of because if you leave them i think that if you leave them in an indoor enclosure when you've just imported them on substrate the eggs of the parasites are going to stay in that substrate right yeah. so it's going to walk around eat get some eggs it's going to keep on going right so just break that cycle get them wormed keep them indoors for a few weeks and then i would release them slowly so i would release them for one day a week right so then they get to graze and eat some of those eggs that are endemic to bangkok because you're introducing a naive population to them if you straight on put them on it for seven days they're eating all these parasites they're eating all these eggs that they may not have built an immunity to when they were back in africa or wherever they came from so once a day for a week for a month just kind of let them them graze and maybe maybe they're building an immunity maybe they're not but for me it's just what my vet and i came up with that we thought would be a good idea to slowly introduce them to the burden of parasites that could be because it's no doubt that bangkok has a huge burden of parasites especially to a naive tortoise that is stressed mm. potentially dehydrated you're looking at troubles if you're just taking it oh it's going to be so good if i take it and i leave it outdoors i'm doing my, the best it can be it's like back in the wild it's amazing no it sounds intuitive but i think it is counterintuitive bring it in understand that is stressed, dehydrated, and probably the parasites have taken over because of the weak, because of the stressed immune system. Yeah, um, yeah. Slow it down. Slowly introduce it to the outdoors. Don't just fully go. Oh, it looks ha happy now. I'm going to put it outside because you've got all the naive populations of parasites that are native to Bangkok. Right. Mm -hmm. All these birds, all these cycles. Slowly, 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 slowly with tortoises. Really, slowly, slowly. So, so from let's say this, like you just get the animal in to it living outside full time. How how much time would that interval be? Do you think it it would depend on each individual one, but probably like five months. Okay, so a very yeah. very long, slow, gradual. Yeah, yeah, five months. I'd say two months or one month without substrate, because I, I I would send the fecal samples to the vet, and then he would check how they were going. So we were going off that. Okay. Um, if the fecal samples were looking good, then we'd add substrate, so it could be a bit better for the animal. And then when we decided that they were good, we'd slowly introduce them to the outdoors while still trying to check their fecal samples by bathing them. And if they if they defecated, we'd just have a look at it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Would you start to see an increase in local parasites come up through those fecals as well? Or by that time, you weren't collecting as much fecals because they're doing it I don't outside? Think and I don't think you'd be able to differentiate local or not, but you'd be able to see the numbers. And then, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, if, like quantities start yeah, to increase. If the numbers are too high, then you'd probably go like, oh, maybe it's just not ready yet. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Or the warming I, protocol was wrong and we need to worm it again, you know? But once you have them outside and they're established as, you know, after the five, six months, do you see that as a pretty crucial aspect to tortoise husbandry is having them outside in the elements, depending on where you live, obviously. For me, for me, it's it's easy, but it's not just easy. It's it makes me feel good. It it makes me feel good that they can have the space, that they can have the will to be enriched by what's around them. The fact that they've got this grass that they can eat, um, the fact that they've got this pool that they can wallow and dig as much as they want, the fact that they've got a lot of areas to lay their eggs. Um, the fact that all these things made the fact that I could plant plants 
and they would drop their flowers and the tortoises would eat it. Or the pancake tortoises would climb up a hibiscus tree to go and eat the leaves until they were wow. no leaves, you know? So just seeing like a pancake tortoise climb a hibiscus tree to grab some leaves that keep getting higher and higher, it makes you feel good. It makes you think that you're giving that tortoise something to do instead of just, you know, like like going around, going around, food bowl eating, go, uh, going around. But there are some cases where that's the best option. Yeah. Did you have to do anything outside in your backyard to protect them from natural pred- predators, birds you know, and whatnot? I was thinking about this every time I saw people keeping turtles and tortoises. Because I was I was a big Cam Kennan fan when I was young. Um, his first videos, I used to watch him inside and out. And um, I was always like, why is everyone worried about all these predators all the time? I never worried once, yet I had um, Asian water monitors that were going around. Never have I had an egg a tortoise, anything eaten. But I think it's because I had two two boxers uh, as, as dogs. Okay, and I, that helps. They made everything that was even trying to go into our yard go away. But I've really never had problems. Yeah, the dogs definitely help. It's amazing just even the scent of a dog in a yard. As soon as that's yeah, gone, so. suddenly you get all these weird animals in your yard. It's like, what yeah. the hell? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it's, interesting. And then... What about just the, uh, actually, I want to talk to you about diet first. Obviously, you're working yeah. with different species, and, and so they're not yeah. all eating the same thing. So yeah. how are you You're feeding them? You're talking about some hibiscus flowers and leaves and yeah. whatnot and, and some elephant grass, but what was your standard protocol when it came to feeding? Yeah, I, I just want to lay one thing out first. Like when you're first, if you're if you're someone that worries naturally and you're a first-time tortoise keeper or, or you're going into it, you, it can be so much to worry about um, keeping your tortoises outdoors and what's dangerous what's that i've got all these varieties of grasses you know is it poisonous is it toxic is it deadly i've i used to worry so much about these things but you tend to find that tortoises will eat what they feel comfortable eating and it will quite strictly stay on grass and not really wander past things that could be too dangerous so i say that a lot of people will go you cannot feed kale because it's high oxalates things you cannot feed that because it's super high in this, but the kidneys do have a function and they're there for that. And so is the liver, but you can offer them all these little things, but it, it's just a question of just don't give it that every time, right? Variety is key. There are some days where there are some weeks where my feeding looked like on a Monday morning, it would be Missouri, Missouri soaked mixed with Timothy and alfalfa hay, right? Um, and then I would, I would add in chopped, um, chopped um, the baby mice for the Knixis and the, and and all that so that would be a monday then i would so that's feed. how you were achieving the higher protein for the kinexis yeah through yeah mice. so okay. through, through mice um and then tuesday but but then again every time it rained the kinexis were eating wild snails right so right so if it was a raining season i kind of wouldn't and i would see that i would see the kinexis run after millipedes and snails in their enclosure which is another reason why i loved just having them outdoors because i had these snails and these millipedes that they'd run after and it, and there's these videos of them in, in Africa eating these millipedes and they're That's running cool. after them and seeing that happen in your backyard. You're telling yourself that you must be doing something right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, and then maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, I wouldn't feed simply because they're outdoors and all my tortoises had access to graze to, to gr- different types of grasses. And I throw in seeds of whatever wildflowers sometimes. And then on, and then on a Thursday I would do a big feed. So I would buy local Thai vegetables that, that you know like okra um chinese kale uh r- salad all types of things papaya and it was so cheap so i just mix all of that up together and i just throw it in but i would never sit down and go like oh this one's so high in oxalates let's go with something low phosphorus like um I, I mean i don't know maybe you should but for me it was more of a question of just let's go for variety let's go let's let's plant some mulberry trees in that corner and just whenever I see there's too much in that tree, let's cut some branches off and just give them off to everyone. You know, mm-hmm. I like being free of what I wanted to feed them and just seeing, and just seeing if how heavy they were. And if one just laid an egg, okay, I'll give this one extra Missouri. You know what I mean? I wasn't constrained to a feeding schedule because they were outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely simplifies things and you can be a little bit more, like you said, flexible and free when it comes to the feeding yeah. and, and the variety is probably the the most important part. Yeah. I think another really important thing is that fertility tends to be quite high when you're giving a high protein diet. In my red foots, I would give them a lot of hard boiled eggs. And um, my female was pumping out numbers that were like, you know, like, wow, I had one female and I could get like 20 babies a year, like 20, 25. Wow. 
and um she was genuinely a beast she would graze uh, she would eat she would eat flowers she would eat the snails eat the millipedes and then once a week she'd have her big feed with some hard-boiled eggs and she never had a problem and she's still breeding with my friend till this day you know yeah now what about the just the ethics in general of keeping some of these chilean species i mean we're talking about animals that live a long time and yeah. you know you, th- that that's where we run into issues especially like the larger species sulcata and whatnot or aldabra oh, yeah. even for that matter you know you're talking about tortoises that live out outlive us how do yeah. you i mean you know for me there's a reason why i don't keep tortoises and turtles in in the uk mm-hmm. you have a lizard it spends a lot of its day hiding it's kind of normal right varanus especially they come out they do their thing they bask I feel like they're enriched enough in their enclosure. Chameleons, they seem to be doing their thing. You have a tortoise, it's out in the morning, it's pacing. It's hitting the glass, it's pacing. You're giving it food, it's eating. Then it's pacing again. Going into the water bowl, drinking, then pacing again. And if I saw that the whole day, I don't think I would be fulfilled because I had that experience as a child of growing them outdoors. Mm -hmm. However, perhaps if I started indoors, it would have been different. I don't say indoor keeping is bad. I think indoor keeping is great. You're having, your inputs are controlled. Your outputs are measured, right? You know what's going in. You know the temperatures. You can do research on them. In terms of developing the colonial husbandry, we need to keep indoors um, because there's too many varieties in outdoor keeping. Someone's success outdoors could be so different worldwide. Mm, Whereas yeah. in indoor keeping, we're standardizing numbers. We're standardizing methods that can be that can be compared worldwide. So I agree that it's good. But for me, I cannot do it simply because of how I kept mine as a child now. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's kind of how you started. And, and I, it makes sense. I mean, I think there are probably some ways that indoor keepers could probably help enrich. Do you have any ideas for that? If if, if, if you see a tortoise pacing, like, uh, are yeah. there some things that you've seen in the outdoor enclosures that you could implement in the indoor enclosures for enrichment? I just think that offering visual barriers is a great way to do it. So just adding a big log, adding Mm -hmm. a big tree, adding something where the tortoise is interested in climbing over it or going around it or going or something hollow where he can go in it, then outdoors and over it and then place some food inside the hollow area, place some food on top of it. Just keep it going. And uh, I mean, just keep smaller species of tortoises. You know, there's some, you go on Facebook and you see some Germans keeping these um, Testudo Kleinmanii, keeping these, Mm -hmm. um, these, uh, these South African species. I mean, their enclosures are like copy paste from the wild, man. They've got some succulents in their enclosures, fogging in the morning. And you see these things and they've got like a whole big tortoise table or a a tortoise room for one species. And, and I mean, they're, they're doing it right there that you're telling yourselves that ethically speaking, they've got it on, on, on quite a good level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Egyptian tortoises, things that are very small, you could, you can definitely get away with inside. Do you ever concern yourself with the lifespan? Um, Yeah. The lifespan is quite worrying. I mean, though, though you do not have so much of a sentimental value as a person to a tortoise as you would to a dog or to a a mammal that has a a higher sentient level of intelligence you're telling yourself that it probably doesn't matter as much as to them as long as you transfer them you don't not transfer as long as you offer them to someone else that has the same level or a better level of care Mm -hmm. then you're doing a good job if you're not thinking through it and you're offering them to someone else that has a lesser standard of care then ethically speaking, then you're not doing the job you should be doing to strive to get better animal welfare for your animals. Yeah. So really, uh, like a mainstay of keeping turtles and tortoises really ought to be that contingency plan after, like if you have an animal that's going to live 100 years and you get it in your 40s, you need to have that trade-off, that handoff. And and like you said, if it's just ending up in a home with just as good of care, if not better, then that's a win for the animal. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because I was in a veterinary placement um, the other month and this guy came in with his horse and he said that it was his grandmother's and that she passed and that he was taking care of it now and it's X amount of years old. He didn't even know. And you're yeah. telling yourself, this little stormer is still going, you know, this little troop is still going and and probably got many more years left. It's a commitment for sure. Um, and it can be hard, especially in Europe, if you've got a big, if you've got a sulcata man in Europe, not they're not already they're not very much wanted uh, if you had a galapagos you'd be fine if you had an aldabra you'd be fine but if you have a sulcata 
you got to be ready to find someone that will keep that thing in a garage because you, you, you cannot even keep it anywhere else during the winter than a garage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's going to need space and, and a, a reinforced garage at that because they'll just blow yeah. through the drywall. But UK pet shops do a good job at, at they don't sell much cutters, first of all, and they do a good job at telling them that this is a massive animal, you know? It's not only is a massive animal, it can be a destructive animal with the burrowing yes. baby. Um, the, some males actively pursue and chase you around their enclosure. <laughs> um, they, they're they a very personable. I mean, I had one cut. I never wanted to breathe them, but I mean, for me, it was like that little tortoise you need to have, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, as far as the species that you've kept, I want to get into that rare species as well. You can yeah. tell us the story of how you came. But, but before yeah. that, as far as the species that you've kept, are there some that come out as easier to, to keep that you would kind of recommend for people that are really interested and wanting to get into them and then some that you would say maybe are more advanced yeah i think conixus as a whole is advanced um okay they're so cryptic they're so slow you want i think you want a tortoise that's quite fast paced when you start you know so you worry less something that's got quite a good metabolism quite enjoys basking so all your testudos are quite good but then again hibernation with testudo can be quite tricky so I would always, I think pancake tortoises are great to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, a captive bred pancake tortoise is quite literally indestructible. Um, and they don't, they're, they're fairly small. Yeah, they're fairly small, right? And you can offer it so much enrichment with all these slate stones. You can make something really cool, right? So, and they don't, they don't, they don't walk a lot. They don't pace these things. They come out, they eat, they go back in because they're, they're scared of all the predators in the wild. So they come out, they eat, they go back under there. Even in my outdoor enclosure, they barely use any of it, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably a great way to start. Just make sure you keep them quite humid when they're young because a lot of the adults have some pyramiding. And I think people keep them too dry when they're young, uh, these pancake tortoises. Um, but uh, just going further from that, a lot of the time where these tortoises um, hatch is when the raining season starts in Africa. It's all linked. And then when the raining season starts, these tortoises are, when it rains in Africa, it rains. You know, it's humid. It's hot. It's humid. You've got all these seeds that are, all these seeds grow out and all these seeds are so high in carbohydrates because they're using them to grow and they're growing instead of photosynthesizing. So they're full of carbohydrates from their seeds, from their seed pocket, and they're full of nutrients. So all the tortoises are going around eating all these new, new seeds that have just come out. And I think that, yeah, so I think that keeping your young tortoises quite fairly humid and warm is a good way to start mm -hmm. to, if you're scared of pyramiding. But then again, it's not something you should be too scared with. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's a great tip. And then, oh, so yeah, so you said kind of Knicks, this is something that maybe you stay away from, but pancakes yeah. are a good, uh... yeah, pancakes are good. And then all your testudos are good. Klein money, Klein money is good. You know, it just been tortoises are quite indestructible. It seems at the moment, everyone's having good success with them. Um, stay away from the biggest stuff at first, M make sure you've got the place for it though. Now Dabra as, as health wise as it goes, they do well. Um, yeah. There, yeah, there's plenty of species out there that will do well. It's just all about doing your research and sitting down and and not just research where you're where you're going on Reptile Magazine, you know? Research where, not that Reptile Magazine is bad, they're great, but rept, it's not enough. You need to do research where you go on Google Scholar, where you go on all these websites, where you find a good article that's scientifically written, right? Mm -hmm. About its ecology in the wild, about maybe someone's success in captivity with them. Then you merge it with someone's success in Reptile Magazine, someone's success on Facebook, um, how these different people are keeping them. And then you make your own little world from every, from the knowledge you've picked out from all these different places. And you go, everyone's got these pros. Some people have these cons. Let's merge them all together and create my ideal uh, uh, ideal way of keeping them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of times too, you're looking for reasons why you shouldn't keep them as well, right? Like you want to yeah. find those because sometimes we can overlook those negatives. And if you, because you're so excited about the prospect of potentially yes, getting a new exactly. animal and, and it can be yeah. distracting. And since instead you got to find like, okay, this does probably get way too big. And realistically, I, you know, live in an apartment, that would be kind of a goofy thing to get. And, and so you have to be pretty honest with yourself. Man, those Nile monitors were crazy. The stuff you've seen about people keeping Nile monitors in apartments <laughs> is mad. Oh, I mean, it still goes on. There's still, yeah, it's that. Yeah. If, if the animal's getting beyond six feet, it's, uh, you know, or like, you know, bigger than that, even that's yeah, going to be I mean, a problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll dig into the Melanochelis trichorinata then the, uh, three killed hill turtle, I think is, is its common name. So, um, this was a turtle that I knew very little about before. No one really knows a lot about them. There's three or four, maybe 
articles about their behavioral um, ecology in the wild and no captive breeding article about them or no captive husbandry article about them. One guy on Instagram publicly posts about his breeding success. Um, so I saw them in the corner of my eye in a in a fish shop, right? So I go into the fish shop because I was going to buy some loaches and then I see this little bucket with um, with two turtles in it and I look closer and then I'm like, no way like uh, you know like you look into this small bucket and you i thought there'd be like some black marsh turtle like you see them all the time in thailand and then i look close and i'm like three yellow stripes maybe like maybe it's a mud turtle you know but surely it's not a... and then i picked them up and i was like wow it's they're a very striking turtle so i invite you to look at my instagram or to search up uh, melano keles trichurinata online they're very unique and um so I was like, how much are they? And then and then they said some I think it was something like 10 to 15 dollars for the, for both of them. So for me, it was like <laughs> like the, the, I was like, I came in with enough money to buy a few fish, but I had enough money to buy these two turtles. So I was like, <laughs> that's a no brainer for me. They were kept in a small puddle. They had one had shell rot, severe, severe, severe shell rot. So I was like, et ethically speaking, I need to buy these anyways. Um, and then they were in the country for ages as well. So I brought them back home. I made a nice outdoor enclosure for them, but I didn't put them straight in because I wanted to fix that shell rot. So I was doing I was doing some rinses, keeping them dry, dry dock. I was dry docking them, but they're okay to be dry docked because they're terrestrial turtle. And then I made these superb enclosures for them with a misting system and the, all these logs that they climb over. And these things were like they're like a mix of a box turtle and a cura a cura in terms of how they look maybe in a box turtle in terms of temperament when it was raining they were pacing like ne i've never there's videos on my stories of it under the trick arena to highlight of them just pacing around the enclosure pacing and climbing all these trees and climbing everything and i was like and i was one and i kept researching and then i saw this article that said that during the raining season because their raining season is three four months and then the rest of the year is basically dormancy mm -hmm. because in these high altitude regions, it gets so cold and so dry that they become they dormant. For, yeah. For months, you were talking like eight months a year of dormancy. And I was like, why are they moving so much? Like I've never seen anything like it. it they, males would never stop. And then, um, so I researched and then I saw that they did this research with a string on a male and they measured how long it would go a day with the string Then they'd measure it. And it came into something like four kilometers in the active season of wow. males females had a lot less because the males would pick out these different locations of they would walk and walk until they found a female and then would keep walking but the females would kind of stay confined so the males would walk and walk and walk and try and mate and then so i i i, I figured that out and then i was like so i've got two males is there a female in this country because the two i bought were males and then i looked i looked and then someone had a female no males and he was like oh i'll just give it to you for free so you can try and breed it and i was like okay great and then, um, and then I put the male with the female and then the females just completely went crazy and, and charged <laughs> at him and was biting him and all that. And then I was like, oh my God, I'll never be able to breed them now. And then, and then I was like, and then I texted this guy in Spain, I think Spain or Italy that was breeding them, or he bred them twice. And he was like, you need to put them in eight inches of water or seven inches of water so and i was like oh, my female's gonna drown you know and he was like no because the female is just gonna keep biting the male so then i put them in there and then the male and then this and then i found this other pdf document online about uh, i think peter prashak did it and it shows the whole sequence of how the their reproductive site their reproductive behavior goes so there's this whole thing where the male has to successfully get on the female um and then and then try and copulate if it does if if they if they fall to the side, it doesn't work. The female goes away. Then the male tries again. If he gets on her side, he needs to do a few bumps before he actually penetrates. If it doesn't work, you have to restart again. So Peter Prashak did this whole nice illustration of it. And at this point, I was getting how much more complicated can this thing get? Yeah. And I, 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 I suppose that in, in, in the raining season in Nepal, in these high altitude regions, the, there must be so much water in terms of flooding that these males may be able to somehow like that uh, kind of get on the females so the That's water I mean, actually helps him get up on top and sort of or, defy or gravity possibly, a little bit or possibly i just ended up with the worst female ever and she, <laughs> it was just my two males were traumatized by her if there wasn't any water like they would run away they learned to run away and i would keep them a year apart from each other and then introduce them and if there was no water the female would just go bonkers so the water would slow her down enough to yeah it would slow her down enough for the males to kind of swim onto her 
and then they would kind of get on her and then, and then move like that and the back i've got like that like exactly like heel semi spinosa breed very similar to heel semi spinosa very aggressive and then and then the males would twitch their head on the females and they did all these different rituals that i've never seen in any fresh any terrestrial turtle it's absolutely insane um and i had a few i th i thought i had a few successful um copulations and then and then a few months later i thought my female gained a few few a few extra uh, grams and i brought it to the doctor to get an x-ray and we had two eggs in her so i was like oh you know what i might be able to crack this this thing that's been giving me a headache for you know i had them for two years i was like this is like another story of of, of the impossible to crack yeah yeah and i was leaving the next month for vet school and then we had the eggs um we had the eggs and um they never really hatched um they 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 never really they never showed signs of fertility or chalking they never hatched and then i gave off my collection and the person that had them sadly didn't have the drive that i had to try and breed them and crack them so he never really bothered with the whole water thing he tried to put them together once a year but the female would buy him i said and i said the female wouldn't let it happen and she didn't let it happen and and i mean it's something that i would have loved to finish because of how yeah. rare breeding is so when when you have a, how did you, how did you add the water into the enclosure? Like, is this an, in the oh, outdoor enclosure, or what did no, you do? So I, I would take them into these cement mixing tubs. Okay. So I would put the female in the cement mixing tub, leave her there for a bit, then put the male in. And, and was then, she submerged, like her head even? Um, yeah, her head was submerged, but she was always able to to grasp. It was enough for her to grasp air at all times that she needed to. Okay. Yeah, and it was always supervised. Like it was something I would spend a Sunday two hours on, you know, <laughs> that's yeah, exactly yeah. for me. Um, so yeah, it was something that that I would be really supervised with. I would always make sure she was okay. And and because uh, this Spanish guy was telling me to do it like that, and he was correct, you know. Who would have then, known? I would have guessed that. Yeah, that I mean, that just yeah, it must like basically flood in the in the wild. Yeah, and then yeah. once that happens, and they go down into the winter and burrow, were you trying to replicate that hibernation or brumation period, for or is that it just was too difficult? Possible for me, like I I don't want to put them in a the fridge. I don't have the capabilities of going crazy and getting a cold room for them. Um, so I just kept them outdoors year round, and I mean, they were in the country for ages like that, and they were fine. I mean, yeah, was I. I got eggs and the guy, the guy in Sp I don't know the guy in Spain hibernates them or not, but I mean, I, I had eggs and I'm sure that if I kept on going, maybe I would have cracked something in terms of fertility or, or incubation method. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. It's, it's kind of fun when you're on that kind of the cutting edge of trying to figure something out and yeah, I feel like yeah. one more breeding season, you probably would have cracked it. Yeah. It was like four PDF articles and I kept looking every month that there'd be something new on Google Scholar about someone having success with them. I mean, the TSA in India, it turns out these photos sometimes where you see like 20 babies next to the adults and you're going like, where am I going wrong? They're keeping the adults together and they're getting like 20 babies. And I'm here doing all these things to try and get one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool though. Uh, you had, had touched on uh, with the, the, the shell rot and whatnot. And, and that kind of oh. reminded me of just, have you, have you had to rehabilitate uh, turtles a lot or, or, or turtles or tortoises? Is that something that comes along Um like in those years of, of keeping or I've been very lucky really with what came in and because I was always very picky about what I would buy and how well okay. they were before I brought them in and I was always respecting quarantine periods and I never had any traumatic injury like you know like like predators or anything like that or like stepping on a tortoise um, um I mean I had a few hatching deaths here and there that I couldn't do anything about really I feel but other than that I feel like most mostly was quite healthy and and never really no, I think I was just very, I was very observant on them. And as soon as something went a bit wrong, I would separate them or just try and get them a bit more food and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And and you'd also mentioned to me in DMs that you had done a placement. I don't know if that was just recently in France. Oh yeah. At, uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so that's uh, Acupulata in France is is is. I don't think it's the largest tortoise and turtle collection anymore. There's Turtle Island and there's um. I think T.Y. Park have a larger one now, possibly. But that now I think they've got 140 species, around 3,000 animals. Um, I mean, they've got a very lot. They're ready to tortoise herd as like 40 animals. And it, it basically all started. Uh, the really weird thing about this is that this zoological park, let's call it, is located in Corsica in France. It's an island of France. Uh, basically some passionate guy that had a, a quite a bit of money would import all these tortoises and have them in his yard. And 
I'm actually from Corsica in France myself. So wow. it seems to be that where I come from in France, there's a larger turtle collection of the world at that time. That's and cool. I didn't realize that till I was like 14. And I was like, well, I actually got to go there and just see what it's like. And yeah, I mean, they, they've got one, they've got species that pe people don't, that other people don't have, like some cura species. They have Chitra indica over there that's open to public. So you can see a Chitra indica. They've got a lot of, a lot of different species. And it's really, I think it's the nicest park open to the public where you can go and see turtles and tortoises. Like they put efforts into all, it's all, it, most is outdoors because of the weather, of course, it allows you to keep them outdoors most of the year. So you've got this big herd of like 40 radiated tortoises roaming around. Uh, this big herd of Burmese uh, tortoises. They breed Manuria impressa like crazy. They've got probably one of the best breeding success in zoos of Manuria impressa in Europe. Um, yeah, they've got many Knixis, many. Yeah, I mean, they're, if you find yourself in Corsica and you're a big turtle and tortoise fan, or even France, get that plane and go there. You won't regret it. It's got this. It, it's just nice to see a collection that's laid out outdoors, very yeah. naturally, no cramping, very ethically done. And how long were you there? So I've done multiple placements there and I'm going okay. back again just because I because there is a director that's a veterinarian there as well. And we get along quite well and it allows me to learn more about turtle and medicine health and whatnot. And and it's just great in terms of it just makes me really happy to be able to to work with such a collection and understand the biology of such a collection when it comes to biosecurity or just simply taking uh, records and anal analyzing all this because because a, a big when you've got this and many species, you're always going to get some abnormal, you know, pathology or something like that. It makes it really interesting. Yeah, I can imagine the amount of knowledge that you would gain just from a couple of weeks being there is probably yeah. like being on steroids, right? You're just like yeah. exposed to tons. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like you, you hold species that you never held before and you, you see them breeding and, and then you see their eggs, their egg incubation room is like thousands of eggs. Like I think they hatch like 900 hatchlings a year or something like that. So, wow. You know, you see a lot of hatchings like that. It really makes it cool because, yeah, when you can do it on a large scale like that, it's really nice in terms of the conservation and, and all that stuff as well because they're educating the public and they're creating a massive stud stud book collection really because it's all, it's all under a stud book, all of this stuff. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, Gabriel, this was uh, an awesome conversation. Is there anything that we, we didn't mention today or, or talk about that you wanted to make sure we detailed before we let you go? No, that's about it really. I, yeah. I've had a time and exchanging the yeah exchanging i mean it really in terms of that it's just all getting together and uh and making sure the turtle and tortoise world just improves in terms of husbandry and all that because we're quite behind i feel in terms of the other reptile keeping uh sectors well i think you gave some some really good just tips and information for people and, and gave people a lot to think about and it was fascinating hearing about the markets and everything and like i said growing up in in bangkok or in thailand you have a totally different experience than someone growing up in europe or north america so you have a you know a different frame of mind so that's that's been fascinating to to listen to uh, as far as where you can be found online you had mentioned your instagram page a couple of times yeah, can you let so everybody know so, yeah so catra so um if you just drop the name in the comment it's s o k uh, a T R A A. Um, it's just an Instagram I've got. It's it's kind of my archive of of everything that I've done on there. So yeah, yeah, it's worth having a look if you want some enclosure, um, motivation and stuff like that. <clears throat> I put a lot of effort in the enclosures on there, but yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure that's in the show notes and and I'll probably uh, pull some images off for for YouTube as well, so people can take a look while they're watching. And uh, until then, maybe we'll have to do another one in the future because I feel like you're going to have a lot more yeah. experience over the next yeah, couple well, of years and grow into the field of of veterinary medicine. Surely, yes. Yeah, we'll have to learn more about that. But until then, Gabriel, thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure. All right, thank you very much. All right, that is the end of that episode. Gabriel, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and sharing your stories. I think it's fascinating hearing your perspective as someone who grew up in Thailand, getting to interact with not only the native wildlife there and the animals that end up there, but those markets were fascinating. And also just, I think you dropped in some really important tips and tricks for people that want to keep colonians or people who are already are. And there's some, some great, valuable information there. Listeners, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. As you guys can hear, my voice is getting more and more strained as I go through this. So I need to wrap this up soon if you want to support the podcast financially you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home 
or you can check out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you make a purchase through there, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that helps me support the show. You can also rate the show on both Spotify and Apple. That really does help our visibility in those two apps. And that's a great way to simply support the show if you're looking for just something quick that you can do. And of course, always just sharing on social media is a, a, a great thing as well. For any more information on the podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com and I will catch you guys in the next episode as my voice begins to fail. I'll see you then.